Bonjour, je suis not manly, et ici le voyage d'espace, je ne sais quoi. This is part two, where we're going to explore Minmus, the second moon of Kerbin. Minmus is uh, about two and a half times as what it was, 320 kilometers diameter on average, but having the same mass and the same surface gravity as stock Minmus. It has a little longer rotation period and a longer orbital period, but it has the same inclination, making its approach a little more challenging for newcomers, but I'll show you how to overcome that in a bit. Delta V to get there is just slightly more than to get to the moon, but capturing and landing on Minmus is a lot less expensive. That makes Minmus a very good first-time destination for beginning players, both in stock and in je ne sais quoi. Highlights you get lots of early career science points out here. The science multipliers are pretty high, as are the funds multipliers. Low thrust to weight means easy landing for very complex craft, and there are beautiful views that I will show you later on. Gotta be careful though, that low gravity means that rovers could be pretty unstable. There are some dangerous spots up at the poles, and that low gravity might encourage some overconfidence, so be careful when approaching this world for the first time. We're going to send two craft up to Minmus, and here we are waiting for the orbit of Minmus to pass under us before actually launching. And then when we launch, changing our inclination during the ascent is pretty easy, and a lot less expensive Delta V-wise. You're doing that while you're doing the majority of the ascent. This craft is very similar to something we sent up in the Je ne sais quoi space race using a similar launcher, but inside there, We've got uh, a single Rovemate uh, probe in there, and a single command seat. What we're going to do is we're going to land the rover first, and then we're going to land Bob Kerman on there, and he's going to drive the rover around. We're going to use Bon Voyage to do that, and we're going to get around Minmus to get to as many biomes as we can find. This being a science mode playthrough, it's a little easier to do this. We're not worried about point uh, craft limitations, part count limitations, that sort of thing. There's the rover itself, it has a full science suite aboard. The rover wheels are spaced out a little bit using cubic octagonal struts to give us a little wider wheelbase to help compensate for that instability that Minmus does in rovers. This uh, insertion or uh, ejection craft has plenty of Delta V to get to Minmus, to capture at Minmus, and for the most part to land at Minmus. Pretty good, it's a pretty light rover. And because we launched on roughly the same inclination as Minmus, ejecting out to Minmus is not going to give us any inclination penalties in Delta V. That makes getting out there uh, pretty easy and pretty cheap. We're just going to do a pretty fine approach here, make sure we get nice and close to Minmus, so that when we do our deorbit burn and landing, it's not going to cost us so much Delta V. There we go. How low do we go? 33 kilometers. Not bad. Not bad at all. And there we are using the controls built into Kerbal Space Program 1.7 to get our approach nice and fine. I do the same thing to get Bob up there. I wait until we're directly under Minmus's orbit. I wait about 10 seconds before relative ascending node. And then we launch. At that point, again, matching inclination is really, really easy while you've got all this control and control fins in the atmosphere. And just to avoid space junk, I detach this stage just as Periopsis is still within the atmosphere. And there we go. This lander is supposed to have enough Delta V to get out to Minmus, land on Minmus, and come back to Kerbin. The problem is I got a little distracted there by whatever that object was on the surface. And well, you can see my uh, Delta V requirement go down and then start coming back up. Come on, pay attention there. I end up wasting an extra 100 meters per second before I realize, uh, oops. Uh, we need to backtrack a bit there, which was my second mistake. Not only did I make a mistake by spending too much Delta V, but I compounded my mistake by spending another 100 meters per second to come back. I'm going to regret that later on in this mission, as you will soon see. Here's our first approach to Minmus. This is the rover. And we turn on Kerbnet. I got too close before I realized, wait a minute, I need to try to find some anomalies if I can. And I am lucky enough to find the, that one down there. And from the space race, I remember that is the permanent monolith. So hey, we'll get to go visit that. This is a science playthrough. I'm not going to be too worried about finding the, the green randolith. 
But hey, let's just go there and look at our gorgeous approach to Minmus. It's pretty dark there on the dark side, but as we approach, the game's ambient light settings take over and then we can actually see bits of the surface. And there we go. By the time I end up closing the orbit for the rover, it's time to close the orbit for Bob. They approach within about an, one, about an hour of each other. So just as I finish closing Bob's orbit, I end up uh, realizing the rover is directly above where I want to be. So I'm still within signal range of Kerbin. I wait for it to re-enter signal range. And then I do my deorbit burn. I pretty much go straight down because this lander and this insertion stage has plenty of extra delta V. Unfortunately, I couldn't say as much for the command craft, which, well, you'll see, I just end up compounding my mistake even further. But hey, that's okay as long as this rover makes it down here safe, which it does. Not a problem. You know, in hindsight, I probably should have landed the command craft first and then use the rover's extra delta V to pinpoint that landing because I could have afforded it more on the rover than I did on the command craft. But hey, this is where that overconfidence can come in and bite you. So do be careful if you try a mission similar to this one. Figure out which craft uh, can spend more delta V and use that to do the fine landing approach. And then use the more expensive one to do just a straightforward landing. Otherwise, we do get Bob here to land somewhat close to the rover. And there we go. Those landing legs, though, uh, I must have them set pretty low because they don't seem up to the task, even for Minmus. This craft can't be that heavy, can it? No, I try to turn it off and, well, it just falls over and then the legs, well, <laughs> boing. <laughs> Ah, KSP physics, don't ever change! But after a second bounce, uh, it seems to settle out a little bit better on some flatter terrain. As long as I keep SAS turned on, this craft should hold position because even if we lose signal, that craft will hold whatever command it was last given. And there we go, we send out Bob to the rover. So the plan was to use that experiment storage unit on the rover to take one copy of all the science experiments and then have Bob take another copy of the ones that require repeats, for instance, surface samples, mystery goo, and science junior. There we go, we're restoring from the last bit there because we did take some readings while up in high space. So we're going to fill up on science just here. The Midlands is our first biome. I end up working on a workflow where I gather science, I collect it in the, sci in, in the experiment storage unit, then I get Bob out of the seat, reset the experiments, and then I take the data and then, and then put the data back. That seems to work for things like surface samples, EVA reports, and other things that took up special slots in the Kerbal's uh, science uh, storage areas. There we go. More green sandstone. We'll put this away right away. We'll put this in the safety of the command craft. And we'll top up our EVA propellant and we'll go back to uh, the rover. I'm going to use Bomb Voyage. It is built into the rove mate in this edition of Bomb Voyage. So we're just going to go to the next nearby biome. Okay, pick on map. Bomb Voyage will identify the biome for us. And there we go. So I end up picking the middle of that Highlands Crater, hoping it was pretty flat in there. Just over that hill, I think. Yep, I save first. If you're going to use Bomb Voyage, save your game before you activate it, in case the craft ends up in a strange position. Fortunately, that didn't happen here, but the further you get from your starting position, the greater the chance the craft will have a strange orientation when you get there. This is that Highland Crater there. Now again, if I were to take a surface sample, store it in the experiment storage unit, and take another surface sample, I wouldn't be able to take another surface sample. I ended up taking the data from the experiment storage unit and then restoring it. It seemed to give priority to the surface sample that I'd already taken. That way I was able to take two copies of everything I needed to take two copies of. 
I didn't need to have an extra command pod or anything attached to this rover. Not bad, not bad at all. Get back in there and get to the next biome. We do get out to where we found that anomaly. That is the static monolith right there. And from this view, we get a very good overlooking view of the westbound uh, basin out there. My goodness, look at that. And there's this valley right between the, the basin and the lowlands right here. I think that's going to be our screenshot right there. That's going to be our thumbnail for the video. Look at that. Now, we're out of Kerbin's signal range right now, so we can't just leave another uh, waypoint marker. But Bob here does have something that we can leave behind. Yep, you figured it out. We've got... Oh, come on, Bob. Bob, camera's over here. There we go. There we go. We can always plant a flag. So we'll know to come back here later on to get better screenshots or something. Not a problem. Don't worry, I'm not going to play the whole anthem this time. Just this little bit. There we go. So get aboard back on that seat and we'll go up to the next place. This is another Highland Crater. It just looked pretty steep. I'd want to get some good shots in there. There we go. After a little more biome hopping, and even a lot more biome hopping, we find our way up to the poles, and I go as far north as I can, and I find this. Look at that at 89 degrees latitude. I have no idea how tall that thing is. What I end up doing is I save the game, and, well, let's uh, see how high that thing goes. Look at that. Check that out. I'm gonna get a good jump over here. I need to save as much of this EVA propellant as I can. There's no top-up tanks here, not in this uh, edition anyway. Maybe with a mod there would be, but not here. In case I needed to reload the game for running out of EVA propellant, I do that. It turned out I had enough to get up to the top of this and get back down safe. But uh, as you'll soon see, there was no way I was going to land safely on top of this thing. If you've seen from the stock game, if you ever visited a pole, you may know this that there's some terrain seams or fissures or whatnot. This one looks uh, pretty dangerous there. Yeah, you do not want to go into that. If you do find a terrain seam large enough for you to fit through, don't go there. As soon as you go below the surface, you will explode. So, yeah. I think uh, the Galileo team did this deliberately to discourage people from walking on top of the poles. This looks like a literal North Pole. <laughs> anyway, there are some objects out here of interest that I noticed. So rather than use more EVA fuel, I use the extra Delta V we have in this uh, rover to go out to these objects. What I noticed was there was a couple of rocks that looked a little different. Where were we? Yeah, that one over there looked a little different, so I tried pointing uh, the rover over there. Navigating over a pole sure is interesting because of that camera. It tries to shift around as the camera shifts over the actual pole. But well, that's okay. We do land there safe. Touchdown. And then we go investigate that. That's one of the breaking ground uh, surface features there that you find if you have the breaking ground DLC installed. Speaking of breaking ground DLC, I do see another uh, piece of green sandstone out there. It's just that little white speck out there. There we go. Now you only need to bring back one sample to get full science value for this, but hey, it's here. I can do it. Let's just go pick this thing up. Look at that. We're gonna have a hard time convincing the folks back home that those aren't mint flavored sugar cookies. 
So I point the rover and I point Bon Voyage at uh, the command craft and just say, okay, let's go straight to the command craft. The problem is uh, when you do that, uh, I'd say that the Bon Voyage is very, very precise. I'd say too precise, in fact. Look at that. <laughs> We said take us to the command craft, not take us directly inside the command craft. Oh my goodness. Which would have been okay if it wasn't for that landing leg exploding. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, in hindsight, if I'd have thought about it, I could have set this thing up once it got some signal, sent it into orbit, and then used the rover to go catch up with it. But uh, no, let's do this properly, eh? I mean, I wasted 200 meters per second. I might as well spend it properly and pay for my mistake. <laughs> Let's try this again. I stop it short by about a kilometer. There we go. And then I turn Bon Voyage off. <laughs> That's better. Let's get this thing upright. The further you go from your starting location, the bigger chance you have of finding yourself in a weird orientation. So make sure you have pretty strong reaction wheels or some way of righting your rover after driving it out there. But hey, we'll just fly it over there. We got all kinds of Delta V. Come on, get back in there. We load the experiments up, we copy them from the rover, we take them out of Bob's pocket, we put them in the experiment storage unit on the command craft, and then we get Bob aboard there. We didn't leave any experiments behind. We do have enough Delta V to get to orbit, but uh, we, we do have enough Delta V to escape Minmus, but as it turns out, that was all we had. That 200 meters per second would have come in real handy right about now. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Rather than go back and redo all of that and and load an old save. Well, I just closed orbit and then I did my ejection and then, well, you'll see what we do later on. That's it. No more Delta V. We are shy seven meters per second about. So we eject that, get a little bigger push and then, well, Bob just goes out to push. Yep. Sometimes the Kerbal solution is the best solution. <laughs> it certainly was in this case. If you do fly this mission, uh, just be a little more careful on your rejection. You'll be fine. Come on. And about three or four EVAs later, we do manage to get Periapsis down to within the atmosphere. I do bring it down to 37 kilometers, which was a good approach altitude, right? And then I, I didn't realize it, but I went to 35. That still was pretty good there. You want to do about 35 uh, kilometers in stock curb as well. Let's get Bob back aboard there and then just coast the west, rest of the way back home. <laughs> the west of the way back home. And speaking of the west, congratulations to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Their first Grey Cup in 29 years. <laughs> My goodness. And I was looking at the surface of Kerbin and I'm going, what just happened down there? And I was like, no, that's not a problem with Kerbin. That's a solar eclipse in progress. Scatterer is doing its thing. You can just see the... There you go. You can see a moon take a bite out of uh, the sun there. <laughs> but did we also take a bite out of Bob? Where's Bob? Uh, I don't see his portrait down there in the lower right. And I'm a little worried there. It's like, okay, what just happened to Bob? Oh, he... there's a space for a portrait, but there's no portrait. Okay, let's... oh, there he is. End up turning on the interior overlay, yeah, just to make sure he's in there. Yep, yeah, Bob's in there. Not a problem. Not a problem, splashdown. Bob comes back nice and safe with over 6,000 science. Probably the biggest run I have ever done in any playthrough of Purple Space Program, of Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> there you go, Bob. <laughs> we'll go out to that moon that's eclipsing the sun sometime in a future episode. Well, until then, I'm not manly. 
fly safe.